Okay, we're now recording. Winton Higgins, welcome to Wellington, New Zealand, all the way from Sydney. Thank um, you. And you're going to be talking to us, to us tonight about mindfulness and the quick fix, I believe. Is that right? Something like that? Yes, yes, that's right. That's right. Yes. Right, well, I'll, I'll hand it over to you and... Um, right. right. Okay. So, yeah, the talk um, I think uh, was advertised as giving was mindfulness, colon, looking for a quick fix. Uh, so, I mean, I guess you're all aware that um, something called mindfulness meditation is a hot commodity these days. And you can find many models on the market, uh, some uh, more or less uh, expensive than others and of variable quality, just like motor cars and washing machines and so on. Um, the, uh, the mindfulness meditation um, brands that are on the market uh, either claim or studiously avoid claiming uh, that they uh, arise out of uh, the Buddhist tradition. Uh, and that's, uh, that can be important because it gives them uh, uh, the kudos and the aura of ancient wisdom. Uh, so what that claim actually is referring to is, uh, if we look at it more closely, is the Buddha's um, own teaching on um, insight meditation, sometimes known as Vipassana meditation, and these days uh, in, the, in the commodified form, the uh, mindfulness meditation. That discourse is called the Satipatthana Sutta, and some of you will be aware of it. So these days we talk about the uh, mindfulness industry, uh, which designs and packages and sells uh, these particular uh, kinds of mindfulness meditation. And uh, the contents of them are actually usually derived from training, uh, training practices that were devised a long time ago in Buddhist monasteries. Um, so the industry brings its products to the market as quick fixes, hence the title of the talk. Uh, and this is in radical contrast to the way in which uh, the Buddha taught uh, insight meditation uh, and uh, the way in which insight meditation was a vehicle for his entire teaching. So. Um, who or what are the uh, target market for these, uh, these forms of mindfulness meditation? In economic terms, it's basically uh, uh, health fund managers and public health services in, uh, in many countries who are looking for um, short-term, inexpensive um, therapies, low-cost therapies for um, such mental problems as stress, depression, uh, anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorder. They're the main ones. Uh, but there are other psychological disorders that, um, that mindfulness meditation has good, uh, good outcomes for in the short term. Um, for instance, in Britain, you can, uh, you can actually get a mindfulness meditation course for free on the National Health Service, the good old NHS, if you get a referral uh, from a doctor. Um, and um, so the mindfulness industry is actually competing with another quick fix industry, Big Pharma. So the alternative to mindfulness meditation is something you get from the chemist on prescription. And that's usually, particularly for depression, you get uh, if you choose either the one or the other. Uh, but then um, many individuals actually um, find their way into mindfulness meditation courses uh, because they are feeling uh, stressed or unhappy. And, um, and of course, there are psychotherapists who are also introducing their clients to these kinds of practices. Um, and on short-term clinical criteria, they basically work okay. 
And uh, for that reason, you find also outside of the therapeutic area in uh, military establishments like the US Marines um, and corporate uh, training, you find that uh, mindfulness meditation becomes part of the training. In the US Marines, I think it's called mental fitness training. So um, what is a quick fix? A quick fix, uh, the defining aspect of a quick fix, I think, is that it doesn't require you to do anything to change your way of life or how you manifest in the world. So, you know, you can go on being um, uh, a high, you can go on being an over busy executive or whatever it is, uh, and um, hanging out at the pub on Friday nights, etc. And that's okay because you're doing your little meditation course in the middle of the week. You don't have to join in any ongoing practice group uh, or commit to any lifelong ethical commitments. And uh, this is where the quick fix mindfulness meditation process fundamentally uh, deviates from what the Buddha had in mind. In the Buddha's version, it's all about ethical values. It's about changing the way we live and becoming deeper, wiser individuals. It's about self-transformation. And how does it work? It does so by ushering each of us into our inner worlds and providing us with a, a detailed map uh, of the nooks and crannies of our own mind, of our own personalities and characters. Uh, and in this way, if you are adopting um, uh, insight meditation according to the Buddhist dispensation, you are being led into leading what is commonly called an examined life. The sort of examined life that Socrates said was fundamental to human well-being. Well, okay, so quick fix uh, mindfulness meditation works just fine unless, heaven forbid, our way of life is the cause of our, all our ills, then we have a problem. So, okay, let's be brave and uh, think about that. And I want to um, I want to introduce this part of the inquiry uh, with a wonderful quote from uh, Friedrich Nietzsche before he went completely insane. And uh, this is what he said 130 years ago. The story I have to tell is the history of the next two centuries. For a long time now, our whole civilization has been driving with tortured intensity growing from decade to decade as if towards a catastrophe, restlessly, violently, tempestuously, like a mighty river desiring the end of its journey without pausing to reflect, indeed fearful of reflection. Where we live, soon nobody will be able to exist. It's a pretty dire prediction, but I certainly want to draw your attention to those words without pausing to reflect, indeed fearful of reflection. So, okay, was, uh, was Nietzsche right? Are we hurtling? Look, Ma, no hands, uh, without pausing to reflect, indeed fearful of reflection. Are we ignorant and scared of what's actually going on in our inner life, under the hood, as we say these days? As a, and um, uh, this is the problem, that we, uh, that we seem to be living on automatic pilot. We are living according to external, uh, external stimuli, uh, without thinking about where we're going and where we're going very much depends on uh, what is going on underneath the hood. So throughout recorded history people have, uh, wise people, have said, have pointed to the importance of looking under the hood, of, uh, of exploring the inner life. The ancient Egyptians actually coined the, uh, the, the great uh, command, know thyself. And very quickly, the Greeks took it up. 
the ancient Greeks, and they chiseled it, literally, into the fabric of the Temple of the Oracle in Delphi. Know thyself. Then the Christian, the early Christians, made it part of their tradition. And meanwhile, of course, back in India, uh, it became the centerpiece of the Buddha's Dharmic tradition. Then, of course, we've got much later in Western, uh, in Western music, art, literature, philosophy, and psychoanalytic theory, exactly the same idea. You've got to go inside. Um, as the Zen tradition puts it, if you want to catch a tiger, you have first to enter the tiger's cave. Uh, so it can be quite, it can be quite scary. But let's ask the question, where, what part does the inner life hold in the way we live now? And dispiritingly for many, it has very little place at all. And at that point, I want to introduce you to a, um, a book that came out this year by Christopher Bollas called Meaning and Melancholia, Life in the Age of Bewilderment. There it is, uh, Rutledge Hagerbeck. Can you all see that? Other than my work? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll bring a copy of this. Yeah, right? Okay. Now, Christopher Bollas um, uh, has, says, uh, talks about this, this problem of our resistance to the inner prose, the resistance to going inside. Uh, and one of his favourite literary examples, he knows his uh, literature backwards and forwards, is a character called Henry Wilcox, Henry Wilcox whom some of you might recognise as one of the protagonists in E.M. Forster's book, Howard's End, uh, published in 1910. And Wilcox uh, makes a famous boast. He says, I am not a fellow who bothers about my own inside. I'm not a fellow who bothers about my own inside. He represents a form of resistance to the inner life uh, that we first find in, in, a, in early Protestantism, which had counseled constant busyness. Um, and interestingly, early, early Protestantism took a very dim view of human life uh, and thought if we looked inside, we'd become so desperately miserable, we'd be paralysed. So it was much better to keep busy. Uh, and busy, 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 of course, meant uh, that you also, uh, you also met that problem that the devil makes works for uh, idle hands. So we've still got this as a very popular form of resistance to inner life today. Uh, you know, we've got that standard retort. Don't ask a busy man like me to think about life, death and the meaning of it all. Um, and of course, uh, that is a bad strategy because if you don't think about them, then they're going to uh, catch up with you. So, um, in the last hundred years or so, the resistance to uh, the inner probe has been gathering strength on Olas's argument. He's a psychoanalyst, and he um, and he has produced this um, diagnosis of what he calls psychophobia. A psychophobia is fear of the mind. And um, uh, one, of the, one of the manifestations of fear of the mind, of psychophobia, is what he calls the normopathic self. The normopathic self, because it has no access to the inner world, uh, it can't be inner directed, so it simply uh, copies what the crowd is saying and doing. Uh, in other words, becomes a uh, conformist. And uh, to my mind, the great um, Italian classic film from 1970, The Conformist, uh, made by Bernardo Bertolucci, really nails this kind of character and uh, and the danger inherent in that sort of blind conformism. Today, um, uh, Bolas argues one of the widespread 
uh, expressions of psychophobia takes the form of what he calls transmissive selves. And he dramatises what he means by this, by uh, one of his own personal memories of uh, just from six years ago, in one of his favourite watering holes, the Rose Cafe in Venice, California, where smart, supposedly thoughtful people like himself meet their friends for lunch. And I want to read you this, uh, this wonderful scene that he paints. There were, there were about eight of us, and people arrived gradually in pairs and singles. Some did not greet us at first, as they were deep into their phones, largely unaware of the actual world. Others at the table were smiling softly at their groins, reading their text messages. The phones were enthusiastically passed around, photos of an event attended by some of those present uh, were met with the usual exclamations, wow, cool. When we were all seated and asked if the waiter had tried to visit the table three or four times, I came out of my psychic carapace and said, so shall we order? A glass of water was knocked over, bags dropped, alarmed heads popped up. I had verbally barged in, I'm watching another era might have been a seance. So, uh, writers in many disciplines honour the supreme importance of deeply connecting with parents, siblings, lovers and friends uh, in our emergence as fully rounded individuals. Without immediate, and that means unmediated, close contact with such people, even our brains can't grow as they should, and it's something that the um, uh, neuroscientist Susan Greenfield has made uh, has made the point forcibly. Forcibly. Yet uh, this scene at the Rose Cafe is a typical gathering of people who are only going through the motions of interpersonal contact, while they privilege virtual uh, interlocutor, interlocutors who are not present over actual companions who are present and a past event over what's unfolding in the now. So people who are stuck in the eternal round of Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, texting and even email don't pause or reflect or introspect, let alone keep a handwritten journal of their most uh, private emotions and thoughts. They are simply, uh, they are simply receiving and transmitting so-called information. Uh, so their psychophobic transmissive selves, like the mobile phone towers they rely on, they neither add to nor digest the content passing through them. There's, there, there's no inner life going on here. So when we cut off from the inner life, we leave ourselves defenceless against the biggies uh, that life itself invariably lays on us. Uh, then, of course, the quick fix, mindfulness meditation course, uh, can offer some temporary relief. But it doesn't in any way deal with our big existential challenges let alone teach us how to use those existential challenges, like a death of a, someone very close to us, in order to grow bigger and deeper. Only coming to terms with our inner lives, for instance, in a lifelong commitment to living a reflective ethical life will do that for us. There are many ways to do that, of course, but a commitment to insight meditation and to uh, the, ethic, the dharmic ethics that go with it is one uh, royal road to doing that. Okay, so we can laugh at the comedic lunch at the Rose Cafe, but the laughter fades perhaps when we're confronted with an all powerful archetype of the totally unexamined, unreflective life. And I'm thinking here of Nietzsche's prophecy in relation to Donald Trump. 
uh, an individual who's ethically and psychologically unmoored, no lights on inside, finger on the nuclear trigger when not actually tweeting elected by millions of unreflected people just like himself. Um, so, on that uh, happy note, I'll open it up for questions and uh, comment and outbursts of hostility. <laughs> Thank you, Winston. Now, if anybody has a question, can you please go up to the camera, introduce yourself and then put your question. Thank you. Go ahead. Going for some water. Any yeah. questions? Yeah, you have to go. Yeah, you have to go. Yeah, you have to go. Hi, I'm Detta. I enjoyed that. Thank you. So, my Hi. question to you is I understand that these mindfulness courses are short fixes, but I, I would hope, so I'm not sure this actually is a question I'm asking you, I would hope though that this could be a first like little footstep for people to go in deeper. Hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, um, I completely agree with that. I mean, and, and I've certainly met quite a few people who've started off in one of the better uh, mindfulness courses, um, particularly MBSR, who've got a bit of a whiff of the Dharma just, um, just experientially and therefore had sought, sought out a Dharma group um, to go deeper and, and a group that they can um, practice with on a, in an ongoing basis. Yes, so that's quite right. Thank you. Quentin, I'm Noah. Um, Hi, Noah. So I feel like you've kind of laid out the two. There's the unreflective life and then there's follow a kind of Buddhist ethic along with, you know, ethics kind of change the way you live, that kind of thing. Um, what's the, can you maybe talk a little bit about what's stepping onto the path from this uh, an under-effective life, maybe somebody who's just had their mindfulness course and that was their first step. How did they get from there to the, the, the other end where, Kind of they've transformed their whole life um, because I, I think I think many people would just might be just be put off by oh I have to change everything about my life hmm. yeah <laughs> that's, that's too hard I can't do that <laughs> um, I, th I think you probably start at uh, in, in a slightly different place in that if you if you get a, a, a feeling um, for um, for meditation, you know, say you've got been along to an MBSR course or something like that, um, and you think there might be more to it, uh, to let your curiosity lead you into something like one mindful breath. Um, and this is this is in fact what happened to me. You know that I I, I did a meditation course because I wanted to reduce my blood pressure, um, and um, okay that worked fine. But but there was a curiosity about it. I'm an academic, and you don't, you, you're not ha you're not satisfied with something works. You've got to know why it works. <laughs> so you've got to look under the hood. So um, uh, I I just enrolled in a in a in a um, introduction to Buddhism course and got and it was and it was driven. It was curiosity driven, uh, and it was just getting that sense that hey, this um, this really makes sense. And from that point, you work out, um, you gradually work out what the implications are for the way you live. You don't, you don't, you know, uh, sign up to um, the five precepts or whatever it is uh, on your first visit to one mindful breath. <laughs> In fact, uh, Ramsey doesn't probably doesn't have any forms to sign up onto anyway. Uh, but. Um, uh, but I, I think I think you don't you don't undertake uh, the ethics without without thinking about why why are these ethics important you know what what is going on here and essentially you realise that they're not a group they're not 
you know, with Buddhist ethics, they're not rules. They are, they are, uh, they are ethical priorities. They are ethical principles to be cultivated uh, in, in a flexible way. So, you, and you figure out why they're important in terms of nurturing uh, your own personal development and your own inner life. Does that kind of answer the question? Good evening, Winton. Um, Good evening. So, my What's question. What's your name? My name is Ramsey. <laughs> Or somewhere, I'm not quite sure. <laughs> somewhere on this planet. Um, so, I mean, yes. I mean, people have asked my, some of my questions. What, what if we do have stress, anxiety, depression, and we do come along? Well, you, you, you're right. We don't just sign up for the whole nine yards straight away. Um, hmm. So, what what you have described as the the, the the four tasks, or the four tasks which you said have been downgraded to, I believe was your word, to the four noble truths. The four first three tasks, experience life, let go of greed, hatred, and delusion, and stop and savor those moments of peace and freedom. That I would suggest is commercially driven mindfulness. I just spent part of the morning with a crown entities in a team building day going through this with them. But I also made point to may stress that the fourth task, which is the Eightfold Path, that's when it starts getting a bit more, um, I hesitate to use the word meaty as a vegetarian, but it gets more substantial. Would you say that, can you see that? Does that make sense to you? Uh, yes, except that um, I can't imagine that you're going to get through the three tasks in any kind of satisfactory way. In a uh, in a six week uh, mindfulness course, I mean it, it, these these tasks are after all lifelong tasks. They are part of the cultivation of uh, of the inner life. They're part of waking up. So they're not something that that's ever done and dusted. You're always going deeper, and particularly if you um, if you really hit the wall in some way, like a a, a major grief. A major loss, um, uh, or some sort of my, major trauma. It's it's uh, you you'd be working for a long time on embracing that, on moving into that, moving into that kind of um, experience, uh, not trying to shy away from it. And um, so I I, I I just don't think it's um, it's an easy thing to do. I mean, just for instance. Uh, Freud's uh, essay on mourning and melancholia, where he talks about the process of mourning, the loss of someone close to you. Uh, it takes months, if not years, of what he calls unpleasant work. Um, and uh, and it's so important for your, for your own development, for our own development, to go through that process, to open ourselves up to it. And it seems to me that is what the first task is, it's, not, it's never something that can be uh, in which regard as undusted. Hi, Winton, I'm, I'm Jeremy. Thanks for your talk. Um, I just want to kind of follow on from that. And um, I'm not sure who it was that said um, uh, that if you're best not start, but if you're going to go down the path, then you better keep going. Um, and I kind of feel it's a little bit like that when you look at these short-term quick fixes. And do you think perhaps it'd be helpful for some of the people who are marketing these to put a big disclaimer on it saying, um, you may see things that really freak you out and uh, uh, don't expect six weeks to um, sort that out for you. Uh, we're happy to refer you on to the right person. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I think that you know from my knowledge of the um, of the six week courses, you you're most unlikely to um, uh, enter the tiger's cave. You know, uh, it's unlikely to be something that will uh, that will freak you out. Partly because they're they're using formulaic approaches to meditation. 
they're using techniques uh, which, uh, which are not really opening up your inner life. Uh, they might be stopping your hyperactivity in the world for, you know, 20 minutes or 30 minutes. But I don't think they're the sort of thing that they're going to um, open up real biggies. Whereas, you know, if you go on a, on a 10 day intensive insight retreat, that can happen. In fact, I've seen it happen again and again. And if it's skillfully dealt with uh, by the teacher and by the meditator, uh, you come away from that retreat at having uh, having come a having had an awakening experience actually, mm. uh, but but I, I really think that the that the six week numbers do not really um, uh, run the risk of letting those sorts of uh, uh, hobgoblins out of the bag. Thank you. Thank you, Winton. I just wanted to say sorry. My name's Alex. Um, Hi, Alex. Um, and I just wanted to say thank you, firstly, for the talk. I found it really entertaining. I really enjoyed thinking about the um, the reluctance sometimes um, for people when they do a mindfulness course to actually potentially have it change them. And it's interesting as well, reflecting on I guess a little bit of our capitalist consumer society is that we tend to think of a mindfulness thing as like a pill, like in, in the same way as it's going to just change us without us actually having to be changed in ourselves. Yeah. Uh, but my question was more around um, for, for thinking about for one mindful breath. You've talked about the idea of you might have someone who's done some mindfulness courses, they've had their interest peaked in the, in the subject, they might have just seen, and this is what happened for me, you might have seen maybe one or two little references to Buddhism somewhere in there and you're like, oh, that's interesting, I think I'll go down that path. Mm. But if you came along to One Mindful Breath or say if you came, someone came along to um, Kirkaburra Sangha in <coughs> Sydney, what would you say to someone to sort of, to keep that curiosity burning, to, to sort of get them past the point of like, oh, okay, this is something that I'm interested in finding out more about. Have you sort of got like a, I'm wondering if you've got like a succinct little blurb even that you could think of, of, of how you could sort of keep that interest, that curiosity that they've got, continuing on. Oh, that's, um, uh, that, that, that's a tricky one. I mean, from my own, um, I mean, my own experience was going on um, a meditation retreat and, and actually, and, and so deepening into the practice and having all sorts of experiences that, that, I've, that I found quite significant um, and worth following up on and worth continuing. Um, yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of inspirational literature. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is Dick Natan, I guess, um, because he's got these, you know, delightful little books that go cut straight to the chase. Um, uh, so you, you know, there's all sorts of inspirational, all sorts of inspir inspirational literature, but um, uh, you know, it's, it's like anything else that's quite that's quite demanding. You know, if you um, if if you uh, wanted to learn archery, for instance, you're going to have a, lo a lot of ex uh, uh, experiences of frustration of you know, irritation with yourself, and irritation with the teacher, irritation with the bow and the arrow on the target. Uh, so it's, it's um, there's no way in which you're going to avoid having to meet the challenge of uh, perseverance, of persevering with it. But um, uh, you know, some of the, some of the common, uh, the, 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 the most obvious and common reinforcements of, um, keeping moving along the path are uh, friends of, you know, coming together in your sangha, uh, of uh, reading inspirational literature. And um, uh, an another one that was very big for me was listening to, um, well, back in those days, listening to tapes of, of, uh, of uh, Dharma talks given by people, given by people who seem to really have it together. Um, 
That's about, but all, all I can say, you know, it, it, and approaching it maturely and, and saying, look, I'm go, I know I'm going to have knockbacks. I know I'm going to have periods of frustration or uh, lack of uh, sense of inspiration. But I've got to um, have the fortitude to keep going through those periods. It's like being on a, it's like being on an intensive retreat. You know, you have, you have moments when you could gladly uh, walk up the front and strangle the teacher because <laughs> nothing seems to be working and your back aches and your knees are on fire and uh, all the rest of it. Uh, that's all sort of part of the training. It's good to know that that's uh, that's what lies ahead. But it's like, you know, I, I don't think it's any different in that way to um, uh, any other major challenge that you take up in, in, in your life. Thank you, Winter. Mm. You can't get to heaven on roller skates, I think it's the old style there. <laughs> or in a, in a Ford coupe. <laughs> yeah, in other words, it's not, always, it's not going to be easy uh, all the way. In fact, it won't, it's not going to be easy uh, except in small patches. Uh, Peter, do you have anything you want to ask from afar? Um, well, thank you very much, Winton, for that very interesting talk. Um, I can see the pitfalls of uh, you know, the mindfulness business only giving you uh, one step along uh, a very long road. Um, and I guess your point about people being um, intrigued, maybe drawing them further along, I'm not sure how we can facilitate that, but uh, um, it's a very good point. I think you made that. Yeah, you, quick fixes are just quick fixes. If you really want to make something permanent, you have to change something permanently, and that's really all there is to it. And I, I guess from, from my perspective of having moved to Gisborne now, uh, one of the interesting things I was talking to Ramsey about just today was that I've changed my whole sort of routine. I used to be an owl, you know, I'd be up at midnight on the computer and won't wake up until sort of nine o'clock the next morning or something. And I decided to change it around. So I'm going to go to bed early and get up early as well. And I thought I would have quite a lot of resistance to that and quite a lot of angst trying to get that to work. And I was very surprised that um, it hasn't been actually. And I think I'm putting that down to the fact that I made the decision for myself and for my own benefit. I, it wasn't kind of, I wasn't forced into it. I wasn't sort of coerced along. This is good for you. You should do it. And I think that has a lot to do with it. So if people come to meditation because they're curious and interested, then all we can do is encourage them um, and give them as much help and material as we can. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting the point you're making about um, about changing your life. I mean, that too can be uh, something that's curiosity driven. You know, we, one one when when uh, we're talking about changing the way of life in a, and doing it according to certain kinds of um, ethical principles, uh, it can be a, a quite a fascinating exercise. But one of the most powerful practices that I've ever engaged in was, and this was right back in the early days, uh, was about four of us decided we'd do an ethics practice. So what we'd do is uh, we'd make a commitment to meet one fortnight. Uh, and in the intervening fortnight, we would concentrate on one precept. So take the um, non-harming, uh, the non-harming principle, uh, which we turned around into a positive principle of showing um, universal friendliness. Uh, and then we would um, we keep a diary, a daily diary, in which we uh, would really try in those 14 days to be really friendly, not in a stupid, flashy way, but really make a point of being friendly to people we ran into uh, making the phone calls we should make to friends who are having a bit spot of bother um, and all that sort of thing and diarising the whole way 
to figure out what where were the where did the shoe pinch you know we could be really really nice and friendly uh to the salvation army bloke collecting money at the station but somehow it was really difficult to be friendly to the to the kids <laughs> and what's all that about you know to actually um figure out wh why why is it hard in certain situations and not in others why is it harder to be friendly to those closest to us no there's the perfect strangers in whom we have no investment whatsoever you know to give them a smile or even put some money in the in their hat or something like that uh and and so the whole the whole process was driven by this kind of curiosity and then the, the next fortnight we'd go on to the next precept and do the same there uh and really turn things around it, it didn't feel in any way like um you know we were following a recipe of thou shalt and thou shalt nots but we were actually exploring uh, our own inner lives to find out where, where, where the obstacles were, you know, where were the things that we hadn't seen before and that we needed to work through. So, uh, so, you know, so that's, uh, that's one way to, uh, to change and to do it in a way that's, um, that's interesting and attractive and um, you know, attracts one's curiosity. Uh, another, another, um, uh way to do it i think is um is to take on a biggie like becoming a vegetarian now you know, i'm not saying that you have to become a vegetarian if you're going to follow the path but in the group that i was in at the time it was just about everybody was uh, a vegetarian because they really thought about the first precept and i you know when in the first three months or so of, be, of being a vegetarian Every meal felt like a sacrament. <laughs> it was this wonderful thing where I was celebrating my solidarity with all of life. It wasn't that, oh God, I really love a steak or something. It just, all that stuff just dropped away. And I made the transition uh, very, very easily and happily. So it can be, you know, you can, it depends on the way you approach uh, your own transformations, your own program of gradual change which needs to be driven by your own experience reinforced by your own experiences that you are making conscious because you're watching what's going on thank you Winton. anybody else got any final questions um well from uh, from Wellington, thank you very much, Winton. Uh, it was very entertaining, and we we uh, we look f and, and in and enlightening, and we look forward to seeing you here in New Zealand in February when you'll be running a a day long workshop launching the book after Buddhism mm -hmm. Workbook, and available for um, consultations, I suppose one on one with any students who want to have a chat with you. Yep, happy to do that, and looking forward to it. Wellington is, a, is always a great place to visit. Lovely. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. And good night. Good night and good luck. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>